Hello, I'm Tobias Revel. I'm a, a critical designer and a futurist. And what that means is that I spend my time designing stories of our future to try and encourage critical thinking about the technologies shaping our futures and what the ideological and drivers of these kind of uh, technological advances are. And in order to do that, and inspired by science fiction and fiction in general, I spend most of my time world building, which is what I'm going to be talking about today. So we all world build as children. We play out fantasies in order to develop an understanding of the world and build empathy with those in it. By constructing a scenario and saying, what if it was like this? We can start to understand human interaction, language, and social systems. And this scales up to adulthood, where you read books and watch movies and play video games. And you project yourself into these fictions in order to ask what the world could be like. And by projecting yourself into these fictions, you build a relationship with them. I've just started playing the latest SimCity. It's full of problems, as anyone who plays it will know. But every time one of those green bubbles pops up that tells me someone is happy, something inside me says, good, because that's what I'd want. There's a dialogue between myself and the fiction. So how does this work when thinking about technologies, ideologies, and futures? Well, the present is messy. It's full of what futurists call weak signals, small but hidden indicators of the kind of futures that are evolving and what they might look like. The future is also full of obfuscation. There are things intentionally and unintentionally blocking our view. And so it's easily easy to become confused and disengaged from considering how the relationships and interactions that form our futures work. So to combat this, and because I see it as my job, I have a technique. We can clear away a lot of the mess that hides the kind of futures that are evolving and amplify the most pertinent and interesting weak signals to a point of near ridiculousness. Like I say, it's a fiction, but it allows us to re-lens and refocus what's really going on so that we can start to understand it in a different way and develop a critical insight. This is Boston Dynamics Big Dog. It's a military robot designed to uh, help troops out in the field where there's, the terrain is too difficult for wheeled vehicles. It can carry 10 times its own weight, it can right itself automatically, can run at about 10 miles an hour. It's the cutting edge of military robotic technology, as far as we know. And it's coated in a kind of high-tech terror. The problem with it is that we don't have a story with Big Dog yet. Beyond the YouTube videos we see, there's no narrative, there's no understanding. It's difficult to place it in our own lives. <laughs> it's a good way to pause, I got to press story. This is a Photoshop painting that's been doing the rounds recently. And suddenly by changing the image of Big Dog from high-tech glamour into what is essentially a walking, rusty shopping trolley, we end up getting a different point of view on the kind of futures this object holds and how it might evolve and what kind of opportunities and futures it opens up. This is a project that I did about a year ago called New Mumbai. And much like the painting of Big Dog, I was interested in challenging the accepted narrative about technological advance. We like to think that science and technological advance happens in white, clean laboratories in Western university cities and then passes through a rigorous corporate infrastructure down to a middle class end user. But I, when I was researching this project, I was looking a lot at resilience in sort of bottom up rural communities, as well as how to understand technology. We don't just look at how it's used, but we should also look at how it's abused. So I created a fictional scenario of a future Dharvi slum in Mumbai, where the residents of found themselves with highly advanced biotechnology that they use for power. They literally use these mushrooms like potato clocks for electricity and heat. And in the story originally, this started in an Amsterdam laboratory and it was stolen in a hope that it might fuel a new narcotics market and eventually trickle down to the residents where they use it to empower themselves. And I made a whole documentary about this where the story is told from the point of view of the various characters involved. And what we see through the project is how often the outcomes from technology are vastly different from what was intended. And there's a certain naivety in reading a definite and determined future from a technology based solely on its intention. New Mumbai sounds mad, and it is. Like I say, I like to amplify these things to a point of near ridiculousness because it's there that they become readable and compelling. But if you want a real world parallel, you can look to something like M-Pesa. And Pesa was born out of the proliferation of cheap mobile technology across Africa, as well as the fact that it's riddled with a notoriously unstable and unreliable banking system. 
It's a simple system that allows people to make transfers and micropayments over text message. And it works because it doesn't give a false narrative of how technology should improve lives, but just works with what people have and what they need. And Pays has been so impactful that it's now getting heat and light to places that were normally devoid of it, where it was unprofitable or unreliable for power companies to connect distant rural communities to the grid. And Paysa allows people to buy MCOPA credits, which gets them a domestic solar energy system. And this is obviously cheaper per person than connecting up to the grid, and also much better for the environment. But this scales up beyond the desperation of the developing world and into our own world in a way. Uh, the residents of Athens in response to government crackdowns during the riots and protests, and more recently uh, revelations of NSA spying, have begun to construct an entirely alternate internet. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network, the Athens Wireless Metropolitan Network, of 2,500 interconnected nodes, and it's just like our internet. It's full of information and social systems, but there's no Google, there's no Facebook, and there's no government intervention. And this is just a great example of how technology, when released in the world, can often become an enabling tool for bottom-up action. This is another one of my stories, uh, sorry, another one of my projects, 88.7, Stories from the First Transnational Traders. I was interested in how in the post-Cold War, Cold War, Cold War world, we found ourselves in the midst of conflicts between technologies and ideologies, and often these end up being manifested as financial crises. So I wanted to kind of accelerate these conflicts to a, almost like a fictional endpoint, so we could see the kind of futures and objects that might come out of these conflicts. So I created a bank on a boat. And this boat circumnavigates the world at 88.7 degrees in the Arctic Circle, hence the name. And by doing so, it's outside of national jurisdiction, and it can go around the world in 24 hours. And what this means through the story is that it enacts disruption upon nation states, and ultimately, over the course of about 100 years, and the various things that evolve, results in the downfall of the nation state and the growth of some neoliberal utopia. And I kind of wanted to dis sort of demystify the conversations that we're having around global finance, which is something that's so difficult to understand. We get most of our information from a media that's obsessed with solutions. We've been taught to believe that we deserve simple solutions and simple answers to complex problems. And so, following the 2008 financial crisis, the most common popular response was to blame the bankers. But really, to me, the bankers are just a symptom of a marriage between an ideology and a technology. An ideology of limitless growth and a technology that could promise the illusion of limitless growth in exchange for hiding the true nature of the global system. We now live in this kind of a world. The complexity of the systems created to support big data is beyond the understanding of a single person. And so to me, world building exercises provide a way for us to start to see the systems that we have and to start to see the ramifications of what they might well be. But how do we use this to change the world? What does it actually mean? We can start to look at technologies like Google Glass critically and imagine what kind of futures might come out of it. But how do we use that to improve people's lives now, instead of just adapting to change later? The Internet of Things Academy is a project that I'm working on with Superflux in London. We were interested in creating an alternative to top-down, off-the-shelf products and allowing people to craft their own technologies to their own needs. Most people don't understand how the technologies they use work, and they get trapped in a cycle of obsolescence, just buying newer and more complex products as the market demands. So by using, creating the Internet of Things Academy, we wanted to make a platform where people could share designs and hacks to improve their homes and their everyday lives. The idea isn't to enforce some vision of the future that we have, but to enable people to create their own. So it's easy to buy into the technological narrative of the future, and it's easy to buy into what you're told the future will be. We can sit around waiting for jetpacks that will never arrive. So to me, world building exercises become vital because they allow us to view the proliferation of multiple futures that are evolving across multiple places at multiple times. And this is an absolutely vital tool if we're to understand systems that we can no longer see and understand. Thank you very much.